Hello and welcome to Verisk's Emerging Issues. My name is Greg Scobletti and I'm an analyst on Verisk's Emerging Issues team. And today we're going to be discussing PFAS, the forever chemicals. PFAS are a class of chemicals known for their very strong, nearly unbreakable chemical bond. They are a class of thousands of chemicals that have been used widely across a number of industries in a variety of products just a sampling of which are listed here. Why are we talking about PFAS? Well, that strong chemical bond I mentioned means that they don't break down in the environment. So what may start off as a small concentration of PFAS released out into the environment may accumulate over time and linger for a long while in the environment. PFAS may also travel throughout an environment. They've been found in some unlikely places like penguin eggs in Antarctica and polar bears in the Arctic. A little closer to home, PFAS have also been found in us. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, PFAS have been detected in the blood of an estimated 97% of all Americans. So how did it get there? Well, we may be exposed to PFAS in a number of different ways. We may be exposed through drinking water, and this is a major source of concern right now. PFAS have been detected in numerous water samples throughout the United States. According to one 2020 study, an estimated 200 million Americans may be drinking water contaminated by one or more PFAS substances. We can also be exposed to PFAS through food. PFAS may leach from food packaging into food, or maybe you are eating something that has eaten PFAS in its past life. There may also be occupational exposures and also airborne exposures. Now, airborne exposure to PFAS is, at least according to the EPA, one of the less well understood exposure pathways. But according to some research, PFAS may be spread into the air when products containing PFAS are incinerated and they are reported to travel up to 125 square miles from the source of incineration. Now, hold that thought in your mind because it's going to become important in a little bit. Why are we concerned about PFAS? Well, according to multiple US government agencies, PFAS exposures have been linked to a range of potentially negative health impacts, just a few of which are listed here. So as news of PFAS's negative health impacts have spread, litigation has not been far behind. Initially, this litigation reportedly targeted the makers of PFAS itself, and that is where the bulk of present settlements have come. But litigation is reportedly expanding. For example, some recent litigation has reportedly targeted food and beverage makers, alleging false advertising claims because products were marketed as good for the environment when they allegedly contained, or their packaging allegedly contained PFAS. Now to date, there's been approximately over $11 billion in settlements stemming from PFAS litigation. However, modeling from our Arium liability analytics team suggests that this may be a fraction of what could be a significantly larger toxic tort. They have modeled a range of possible ground up losses ranging from $40 billion on the conservative end to up to $175 billion, depending on how certain trends play out. Now, as a point of clarification, in the area model, a ground up loss is defined as the combined potentially insurable non-economic and economic losses from a liability event, in this case, PFAS litigation, before the application of any liability insurance terms and conditions. So I should note that the estimates you see here are, again, just for losses associated with environmental contamination. But as I mentioned earlier, the cases appear to be evolving. They appear to be expanding beyond those concerns. And litigation is also shaping up. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has published a PFAS roadmap detailing the steps they've taken and plan to take to address PFAS contamination. And one major proposal we are going to focus on here concerns drinking water. In March of this year, the EPA proposed a national primary drinking water regulation concerned with these six P 
PFAS here. And this regulation or this proposal would set legally enforceable levels for drinking water utilities for the six PFAS listed here. Now, the contents of this proposal are less important for our purposes than the message, which is that it appears the EPA is moving more aggressively to get PFAS out of our environment and as a result out of products. And they are not alone. The European Union is also looking at taking similar steps to address PFAS. So one of the things we're asking ourselves is, what are there some of the potential downstream consequences of this activity? What are some of the possible consequences of efforts to remove PFAS from our environment and from products? Let's start with the effort to pull PFAS out of products. Could this introduce a regrettable substitution. So in chemistry, a regrettable substitution generally refers to when you remove one hazardous substance and replace it with a new substance that later turns out to be dangerous as well. Sometimes it's even more dangerous than the dangerous thing it was replacing. Now here's the thing, we have already had one regrettable substitution in the world of PFAS and that concerns PFOA, a type of PFAS substance. When concerns around PFOA were raised over a decade ago, chemical makers introduced a new type of PFAS, which was given the name Gen X. And Gen X had a slightly different molecular structure that was thought to be less persistent in the environment. So companies started to voluntarily phase out the use of PFOA in favor of Gen X. Fast forward a few years, Gen X started turning up in water supplies. Researchers started doing tests on Gen X exposures, and it turned out that Gen X also appeared to have potentially negative health impacts. So I'm gonna go backwards for a second and show you something. Now, Gen X is also on the list of PFAS substances that the EPA is looking to address in its water regulation, along with PFOA, in other words, the substitution of one for the other turned out not to really address the potential concerns. So this is a dynamic that we're mindful of as we look out into the various industries or products that may be moving away from PFAS. What are they moving towards? So let's use an example of where a potential substitution risk could form. And I'm not, I wanna underscore, I'm not saying it has formed here, but it's an area, it's an example of an area where we can watch and that's firefighting foams. So PFAS have been used in firefighting foams to fight oil and diesel fires. So you can find them at airports, at municipal fire departments, and also military bases. Now these foams get sprayed out into the environment, both when fighting fires, but also during training. So the path of PFAS in these foams out into the environment is fairly straightforward. Now, last year in 2022, the Pentagon announced that it was looking to replace PFAS firefighting foams with new formulations that would do the job just as well without spraying PFAS into the environment. But the question is, what is going into those foams in place of PFAS? So that is not immediately clear, but what we can assume is that whatever is in those foams is going to follow PFAS out into the environment, right? When those new foams are sprayed, they will land on the ground and eventually potentially seep into groundwater. So we're on the lookout for a regrettable substitution here and really in many different places as concerns about PFAS chemicals continue to grow. And then there is the effort to pull PFAS out of the environment and specifically drinking water first since that is where a lot of the focus is today. Now the good news is that we can filter out PFAS from drinking water. The bad news is that the filters that we, the existing filtering, filtering technology that we do have does not destroy those strong chemical bonds. I'd like to compare it to an industrial sized Brita filter. So with many of these existing techniques, you drop your industrial sized Brita filter into a drinking water utility. It soaks up some or maybe even all of the PFAS in the water. So that's good. Now you don't have PFAS in your drinking water, but now you have this giant filter filled with PFAS and that filter has to go somewhere. What do you do with it? Well, you could put it in a landfill, but at least in some of the cases, some of the advice is to incinerate those filters. So remember what I mentioned earlier about PFAS being ejected into outdoor air 
when products containing PFAS are burned. We could be on the cusp of a massive national effort to remove PFAS from our drinking water. According to the, to the EPA, there could be between three and 6,000 water utilities that will need to, to remediate their water thanks to the levels of PFAS that are suspected to be in that water. But if we are simply capturing PFAS and then burning it downstream, we risk re-releasing PFAS back out into the, into the air, back out into the environment. Now, at a high enough temperature, it may be possible to break those bonds. But EPA research also suggests that some of the incineration processes currently in place that can reach those high temperatures may actually create new types of PFAS about which we know relatively little. And the number of facilities across the United States that are capable of achieving those high temperatures to break those chemical bonds are relatively scarce. They're few and far between and certainly nowhere near as many facilities as those water utilities I mentioned that may have PFAS contamination requiring addressing. Now, there is some hopeful news on this front. There do appear to be emerging techniques that not only filter PFAS, but attack and destroy those strong chemical bonds. Now, some of these emerging techniques may also produce hazardous chemical byproducts as a result, and none of them appear to be ready yet at the industrial scale required for the size of the challenge we face. However, this is an area that appears to be uh, intensely focused on by researchers, again, given the potential scale and scope of PFAS. So these are some of the possible downstream consequences we're watching as the effort to tackle PFAS contamination really starts to pick up steam. So I want to close here by sharing some of our PFAS resources from the Emerging Issues team. You can visit our website at core.verisk.com forward slash EI, E as in emerging, I as in issues. You will find our PFAS topics page where you will find primer articles on PFAS authored by the Emerging Issues team our own original research articles published in reverse chronological order, as well as a selection of curated news feeds from around the internet, curated by yours truly and other members of the Emerging Issues staff. While you're at our website, I encourage you to sign up for our weekly newsletter to receive market intelligence on a variety of emerging risks, not simply PFAS, every week. If you have questions about this or any other of the 60 or more emerging issues that we follow, please reach out to us at the email address on your screen. Thank you very much for your time.